I don't know. Oh, praise God. Praise God. But, so I love you, babe. You rock. Cool. So, without further ado, um, I had like five different titles of a message that I wrote down here. I couldn't figure out which one. I was like, Desha, what should I call this message? You know. But, so, just look at your neighbor. Don't, don't breathe on them. Don't, even if you got some mints, don't breathe on them. But just look at your neighbor and say, don't push. Don't push. Don't push. So, before I get too deep in it here, um, I just want to recap what Pastor's been talking about. If we can turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 46, most of what I say today will be in the New Living Translation. Aha, here we go. Oh, it's not here. That's okay. So I'm going to turn around here. All right, it says, but I say, so this is Jesus talking, he says, but I say, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you or speak evil against you. Let's go to verse 45. Oh, here we go. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So, the way we act as children of God is by loving our enemies. And later in this verse and all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus talking about how it's easy to love people who love us. Um, I was in the drive through at McDonald's the other day, and uh, this woman, you know, McDonald's, you've got the two different uh, places where you can order. And sometimes when you both go at the same time, it's like, oh, you go, no, I go. And this one woman, she went at the same time as this other woman, and immediately, ah, man, just gave her the finger and said some choice words. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't right there. And then... Uh, and then I came up, I ordered, and me and this one guy, we kind of did the same thing. And he was like, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And I was like, oh, cool. And then I paid for his McDonald's, and then I, I believe God spoke to me. He was like, would you have paid for that woman if she flipped you off? And I was like, only you know that, Lord. I mean, <laughs> but I want to say I hope so, but it's easy to pay and love people who love us, but we got to love the people who are even persecuting us, speaking evil against us, and giving us fingers and whatnot. Praise God. Amen. So... We can see also, if we can turn our Bibles to Galatians 5 and 6, this is going to be in the King James this time. Pastor's been talking about this whole series of recalibrate or um, love, faith, and the anointing. We can see that Jesus walked in the highest level of the supernatural because of his love. We can see that everything that Jesus had faith for, he had faith to see people healed, faith to see people whole, faith to see the world change. It was all able to happen because of his love. And we can see that here. It says, For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith is expressed, or faith expresses itself in love. Or another version says, faith works or is activated by love. So, and we, we preach faith here at this church, and I think, uh, I think everybody needs to hear faith. And that's everything. But some people hear the word of faith, and you can speak to mountains, and it'll, it'll move. And then we have people going out and just speaking to mountains and speaking to this, speaking to that. But they're not seeing results, and they walk away from Jesus like, oh, that doesn't work. Well, why doesn't it work? Well, check your heart. Check your love walk. Because faith, the words you speak, the actions that you do, faith, even your obedience to God, it works only if you have a heart full of love. Last week, pastor said that every miracle that Jesus ever did was an act of love or an act of compassion. And I, ooh, I was like, ooh, praise God when he said that. Because even if we know the word, it's very difficult to get it to work in our lives if we don't genuinely love God or if we don't genuinely love the people who we're praying for or reaching out to, right? It becomes very easy for a, a praying mother to uh, manifest healing in her children's lives because she loves her children. So when we love people, then we can see miracles. When we truly genuine love, genuinely love God, then and only then can we see real miracles and true kingdom manifestation. And with that being said, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation. This is kind of like the love 
the love chapter. So follow me here, follow me here, okay, guys? It says, if I could speak all the languages of, of earth and of angels, you know, if I could pray in tongues, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Let's go to the next verse. If I had the gift to prophesy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, it would have gained me nothing. Another, verse, another version of the Bible says, if I don't have love there, then it profits me nothing. Your, your tongues, your prayers, your faith, the gift of prophecy that we all are like, whoa, this is awesome. It means your giving, your good deeds, it means nothing if there's no true agape love attached to it. All profit, profit with an F, P-R-O-F-I-T, is that right? All profit in the kingdom of God comes from a heart of love or a person who's full of love. Amen. Boom. Someone say boom. boom. And then we see here, Pastor talked about this last week as well in Ephesians 5, verse 1 through 2. It says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. How do we imitate God? The very first sentence here, live a life filled with love. How do we imitate God? How do we copy Jesus? Live a life filled with love. And then if we go to 1 Peter 2, verse 23, I'm just kind of kind of building up my case here, as Pastor says. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Peter here paints an amazing picture at how Jesus actually walked in love in a very, very practical way. 1 Peter 2, verse 23. Here we go. V's back there for like the first time today by herself. Give her a hand clap. I told, I told V, I said, I'm going to be real hard on you, V. Come on, you got to get, get together. I'm just kidding. V, I love you. Here we go. So this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. This is Peter talking. He says, he, Jesus, did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. Now, my wife and I were the kids' pastors, so there's some parents out there who are like, amen. And I, be, I told this verse to your, your kids, and they're like, no, my mom and dad, they told me if I get hit, I'm going to hit them back. <laughs> I said, hey, always, uh, and parents, I always push your kids to you. I just want you to know that. Like, All the teachers, I'm like, hey, push them back to their parents, you know, hey, you know. Um, so I'm like, hey, listen to your parents, always. But, uh, you know, the Bible says this. So when he was insulted, he did not retaliate. When he, people gave him the finger, spit on him, pulled his beard out, he did not retaliate. And it's funny how Peter is the one talking about this because uh, if we go to Luke chapter 22, verse 50 through 51, um, Peter had a little incident where uh, he didn't walk in love. Um, yeah, here we go. And you're going to see it right here. So this is a little interaction that uh, Peter had. Oh, Luke 22, 50 through 51. So this is right before Jesus was uh, about to get taken um, to be crucified. Luke 22, 50 through 51. I should have brought my Bible up here, but, you know, us, us young people just rely on all this technology too much. Verse, let's go to 50, back one verse. Here we go. This one's like rated, this one's, uh, this one's a little naughty. This one's rated uh, R here. And one of them, so Jesus was about to get taken. These, the bad guys, they came to Jesus and they're like, hey, we're about to crucify you, buddy. And, uh, Peter, so, okay, this is Peter. It says one of them in the book of John, I believe it says Peter. 
But it says, and one of them, Peter, struck at the high priest's slaves, slashing off his right ear. So they were like, Jesus, you're coming with us. We're going we're gonna to kill you. And uh, how many of Peter's do we have out there who would have said, hey, no, you're not going to kill my Jesus. Swah! <laughs> my, hey, amen! <laughs> if people came in here, Pastor Claude, we're going to take you and we're going to hurt you. Hey, yeah, what? <laughs> And then I'd be like, Mike, Darius, someone help, help. <laughs> Please, get him, get him. Right? But Jesus responded. And he said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Jesus healed the man's ear who was trying to take him to kill him. If you can't try to heal or help the person that has hurt you or tried to kill you, I question if we're really walking in love or not. He healed the person that was trying to kill him. That's true love. And then last week, uh, Pastor ended with, um, um, we kind of ended the sermon talking about Romans chapter 5, verse 5. So if we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 5 in the King James Version. Um, but this love that we just saw there, we cannot walk in that love in our own power. It's absolutely impossible. It's impossible to obey God in our own power. It's impossible to sacrifice or surrender or any of that in our own power. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. So, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who was given unto us. Like Pastor said last week, it's a close, intimate, personal relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, that is able to make us walk in that true agape love. In the book of Ephesians 6 and 10 in the New Living Translation, um, if we could turn there, Paul is talking here. He says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I was like, okay, why did God... Why did God say that? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And he goes on to talk about putting on the whole armor of God. But then if you kind of go back into the beginning of chapter 6 of Ephesians. So we're at 10. But if you go back a little bit, and even into chapter 5. Chapter 5 talks about how husbands and wives should treat each other, how they should love each other and honor each other and all that good stuff. Daisha was going to be serving in the uh, kids' ministry today, so I would have been more comfortable saying this if she wasn't here. But has anybody ever tried to love their husband or wife in their own power? It don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a good person. I'm a good, I, I'd like to consider myself a good person, but my good personness does not work. I'm like, Lord, you gotta help me. Help me, Lord. All married folks say, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Um, so that's, I, I believe that is. If we read the Bible in order, I believe he was saying, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, kind of because of that. And then um, in, e in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, it talks about children, obey your parents. And then he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, because it's hard to obey your parents. Gio and O'Shea, love you guys, the little teenagers, right, middle school. It's hard to obey mom, huh? It's hard, like, mom, let me, just let me be, let me grow up. Come on, stop. Right, it's hard to obey your parents sometimes in your own power, right? Or then in verse, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it talks about parents should not lose their cool with their kids. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. It's funny how, you're, you know, like your guys' kids, they all act pretty good when they're here at church, but, and same with my kids, but at home, blah, it's like, who are you kids? <laughs> You know, Stephen Furtick said one time, he said, there's a lot of people who don't believe in the devil. Just have some kids. <laughs> I said, amen, amen, Pastor Stephen, amen. Um, Desha and I are in the process of potty training our kids right now. Oh, help me, Lord, right? So we've got, uh, we've got our oldest daughter, Sanaya. She's three. And uh, for the longest time, she just, no, I'm not going to go on the potty. 
like, Sanaya, you're the oldest, the older sister, go on the potty. All your friends can go on the potty, you go on the potty. You want ice cream, candy, go on the potty. No, nothing, nothing worked, right? I was, I was losing my cool, I'm not gonna lie, I'm losing my cool, right? And then uh, our twins, we've got twin boys, Justice and Jude, they're two, 10 months apart, don't know how we did that, but. <laughs> So the power of God, it wasn't our own power, praise God. <laughs> and uh, so we've got Justice. One day he was trying to poop on the potty. And uh, he's like, no, Daddy, I don't want to do it, no. I'm like, come on, just poop on the potty. I tried to make up a song. Nothing doesn't work, right? I, OK, I go get a diaper. From the small walk, from where his potty was to our closet to get a diaper, I come back, there's poop on the floor, <laughs> this far away from the potty. And God tells me in Ephesians 6 and 4 not to lose my cool. <laughs> Just the other night, Jude, we were putting him to bed. He didn't have a diaper on because we were, you know, everybody go potty. He's like, yeah, I went potty. And he didn't go potty. He looked right at Daisha sitting on his bed. No pants on, just sitting there. And he just started peeing. It's like, and I'm not supposed to lose my cool. Right? But then, and I don't want to talk about this too long, but praise God. But um, so then I was like, you know, I'm going to be patient. And I, I just talked to Sanaya, like, Sanaya, girl, you got to go on the potty. I love you so much. Like, just go on the potty, baby. You can do it. So I started encouraging her. I start, you know. That was after a good day of being in the presence of God. Like, Come on, you can do it. And now she's, the whole, this whole last week, she's been peeing on the potty. Yeah. Praise God. And then the boys are following her example now. Praise God. But I believe it was because I stopped relying on my own correction. And I started relying on my prayers and my encouragement to them. And even in marriage, it's very easy for me I'll just talk to myself. Very easy for me to rely on my own correction towards Daisha than it is for me to rely on my prayers to God for Daisha. Oh, yeah. Now, correction's good. Correction's good, but like our, our prayers are better. Our surrender is better. And the Bible tells us in Zechariah 4 and 6, we can go there, V, if you want to, but it says that it is not by our own might. It's not by our own power, but it's by his spirit. What is by his spirit or his power? Everything in life is by his spirit and his power. If we want to be able to love and live the way Jesus did, it's not by our own might, it's by his spirit, it's by his power living and working on the inside of us. But the problem is, if we could go to Philippians 3 and 3, I'm just throwing, throwing them at V, catch them V, right? <laughs> Philippians 3 and 3, I'm, I'm going to actually read this one. But this is the problem here. In Philippians 3 and 3. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a problem. There's a problem. Philippians 3 and verse 3. Here we go. So this is Paul talking. He says, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. The problem is that we are not acting like people who worship by the Spirit of God. And we're putting more confidence in our human effort compared to God's effort or God's doing on the inside of us. That's the problem. And I just want to say this here. There is more power in your surrender than there is in your push or your effort. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys like that, huh? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, don't push. Don't push. There's more power in your surrender than there is in your push in any area of life. Ronnie the Third liked that one back there. <laughs> There's more power in your surrender than there is in your push. And Pastor, um, last week he mentioned um, kind of the life or the story of Abraham, right? And so if we could go to Genesis chapter 16, verse 4 through 5. And as V is going there, your push will always produce an Ishmael. But your surrender will always produce an Isaac. Ooh. Some people are like, yeah, I know that story. Other people are like, man, Ishmael. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, it's okay. So Abram 
In Genesis chapter 12, at the age of 75, he was promised that he was going to be made great by God, that nations were going to come out of Abram. And then fast forward three chapters later in, verse, or in Genesis chapter 15, we see that God promises Abram a son. And then the very next chapter, Abram's like, oh, well, my wife can't have kids. She's barren. So uh, Abram had sexual relations with Hagar. His wife was Sarai. That's not his wife. And she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. So, oh, praise God. He slept with the maidservant here. And now he's got chaos in his marriage. Then Sarai says, Abram, it's all your fault. Your push will always produce an Ishmael. What does that really mean? Your push will always produce consequences in the now and in the future. Abram began to push in his own power. He really push. In his own power. He slept with Hagar. And he experienced consequences in the now. He had strife in his marriage. And he experienced consequences for the future. Some biblical scholars and theologians say that Ishmael played a foundational role in the Islamic or the Muslim religion because Abram tried to push in his own power. Look at your neighbor and say, don't push. And then let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 16, verse 15 through 16, just so we can kind of put this timeline together. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Let's go to verse 16, very next verse. Abram was 86 years old. So this was 11 years after God originally promised him that, hey, I'm with you and you're going to be great. Your nations are going to come out of you, right? And then if we go to Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, the very next chapter. So we're in chapter 16. The very next chapter took 13 years. 13 years after his mistake. 13 years. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faith, faithfully and live a blameless life. Let's go to verse 2. And this, at this, Abram fell down. Oh, I will make a covenant with you, which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. Verse 3. At this, Abram fell down on the ground, or another version says he fell down on his face. What does that mean? He surrendered. He surrendered. For the first time in his life, he surrendered. Now, Abram knew God. Abram knew the word. He knew the promise of God. He's heard his voice before, but he was inconsistent. I believe if, if Abram was here today, he would be a person who comes to church. He would be a person who shouts once in a while. But he was inconsistent in his secret wow. intimacy with the Father. He was inconsistent in surrendering to God. But then he surrendered. And in the very next chapter, about a year later, Sarai gave birth to Isaac, the promised son. So your push will always produce Ishmael, consequences. But your surrender will produce the promises of God in your life. Ishmael was counterfeit. He was a counterfeit son. Isaac was the authentic son. And in a world today, there are so many people trying to copy other people. That's counterfeit. But your intimacy with the Father, your surrender in the presence of God will produce an authentic version of you. It's the only way to have true authenticity in this life is to surrender. Outside of that, you will always be a counterfeit or a copy your surrender. Your surrender. Look at your neighbor again and say, don't push. And it's all, it's all about consistency. Um, if we go back to chapter 17 in Genesis, verse number 1, we can see here it's all about consistency. Someone say, it's all about consistency. So when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully. The Amplified Classic Version says, serve me habitually or consistently. And I believe once he started to be consistent, 
that's when things started to manifest. It's all about consistency. Um, a super practical example of consistency that I hope you guys see. I'll step to the side just so you can see. But um, Mike and I, um, we uh, grew up in like the same city, same area. And uh, consistency is important. And Vante. Um, so they're both good examples. Um, but we worked out at the same gym. You guys didn't get it. Consistency. Look at Mike. Look at Vante. Look at me. <laughs> Mike and Vante were consistent. I haven't worked out in seven years. <laughs> consistency. Consistency. Do you see the importance of consistency? If you don't know Mike, he's the big guy in the back. Consistency. Consistency. And with that being said, let's, let's, uh, let's move on. I'll, I'll stand behind the podium. <laughs> let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Cha or ta Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. In the Message Bible, in the Message Translation. Boom. Boom. I believe there's some people in the room, including myself at times, and this message is for me, really, but you've been trying to push. You've been trying to hold it all together by yourself. But God's just asking you to surrender. So this is Moses here. He's calling or challenging the children of Israel at this time to, uh, to live a life of surrender. And he speaks here of the results of their surrender. And you can see all throughout, uh, all throughout the Old Testament, really, the prophets are just commanding and challenging and calling the people to just surrender. Just follow God. Love him only. Just be consistent. Surrender. And Moses talks about here the benefits of surrender. He says, when God, your God, ushers you into the land he promised through your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, you're going to walk into large, bustling cities that you didn't build, well-furnished houses you didn't buy. You're going to come upon wells you... Oh, go back. Oh. Nope. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. Long story short, <laughs> God is saying, or Moses is challenging the people to just surrender. And he says, when you surrender, you're going to be pleased, you're going to be content, and don't forget how your God got you here. Let's go to the next verse. Is there a next verse? Okay, nope, that's fine. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 38 through 44 in the message. But so he's saying, when you surrender, when you surrender, you're going to come into well-furnished houses that you didn't build. You're going to get a new car that you didn't pay for. You're going to get a harvest that you didn't even plant seed for simply because of your surrender. Simply because of your surrender. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38 through 44 in the Message Bible, this almost the same exact lingo, language here, is found in the book of Amos and in the book of Zephaniah. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38. Through 44. So now, this is Moses still, Deuteronomy, he's the author of Deuteronomy. Moses is still talking to the people. Now he says, these are the consequences of not surrendering. So when you surrender, you're going to have things that you didn't work for. Amen. But when you don't surrender, you'll plant sacks and sacks of seeds in the field, but get almost nothing. The grasshoppers will devour them. You'll plant and hoe and prune vineyards, but won't drink or put up any wine. The worms will devour them. You'll have groves of olive trees everywhere, but you'll have no oil to rub on your face or hands. 
because the oil, the, the olives will have fallen off. You'll have sons and daughters, but they won't be yours for long. They'll go off to captivity. Locusts will take over all your trees and crops. So when you surrender, you will have things that you didn't even work for. But when you don't surrender, you will do all the work and get no benefits. You'll do all the toiling, all the creative thoughts, but you'll have no benefit. You'll start the business, but somebody else will take it over. You'll have a good relationship with this one girl, this one man, and then somebody else will take them. When you don't surrender. When you don't surrender, you'll have all this money, and then it'll fall out of your pocket because you didn't surrender. I'm trying to be a little more practical, right? Because you didn't surrender. Everything that you need and want in life is on the other side of your surrender. Yeah. Everything. Pastor, uh, or Dr. Bill Winston had a message, a title. Uh, Pastor Sturgeon and I were talking about it the other day at the barbershop. It said, uh, the whole sermon series was, do bread come with this? You know, and uh, bread come with your surrender. What bread? Okay, so fries comes with this. You don't have to order the meal that comes with it. When you surrender, satisfaction comes with it. We go all around looking for satisfaction with money, looking for satisfaction with people, places, things, but satisfaction comes with your surrender. Direction from God comes with your surrender. Because there may be some people out there today who are like, yeah, I feel surrender is important, but you've got to be a doer of the word. Well, let me say something. You cannot actually do and have manifestation of God's promises in your own power. But as soon as you surrender, you'll have direction and his power behind you. Yeah. But we have a lot of people going to the war without any weapons. Your surrender gives you weapons to fight every battle that comes your way. Your surrender gives that to you. You've been trying to push. But God's just asking you to surrender. I'm saying this, and then uh, I'm closing here. So the band can come on up and give us the, the good stuff. <laughs> but you've been trying to push, and God's just asking you to surrender. If we can go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Hey, now we're up there. It says, so this, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, for Jesus' sake, then and only then will you find it. I personally didn't find my purpose until I decided, God, I'm going to give it up. I had the biggest dreams. My sister and my dad will tell you, all I wanted to do since the age I was four or five was be a professional athlete. Originally it was basketball and then I realized, well, I'm probably gonna be about five, six. So uh, let me just do soccer, right? And I played on an Olympic developmental soccer team. I played on the number, number two team in the state of Michigan, like a travel team. That was my dream. I went to Siena Heights, I was like, well, this is just a stepping stone here. I'm going to go to Siena, and then I'm going to transfer to U of M or walk on to a D1 school. I'm going to go pro. That's all I could see in life. And then I decided, you know what, God? I'm going to give, I'm going to give up soccer. Soccer was my life. I said, I'm going to give it up. And then I started to see that I have more of a life outside of this sport. And then I submitted myself here, obviously. And I decided, hey, I, or I found I have a purpose. I have a purpose. I went to the first time I ever went to a Christian bookstore. I didn't really know anything about God. I picked out a book that said, How to Know the Will of God. I'm going to write a book one day called How to Know the Will of God, just because of that. And my, I didn't read the book, <laughs> praise God. But my, yeah. Maybe I should have read it. So whoever wrote the book, I, I don't know. If you ever see this, I apologize. But I, I, I originally got the book with the intention to read this book, and then this book would solve all my problems. I would know exactly what God wanted me to do. And 
and this is just my opinion, but even just reading the Bible without surrender, you still won't be able to know his will for your life, his plan or his purpose for your life. Because we see Saul, who was later became Paul, he knew the whole word, he knew all of the law better than anybody else, but he still didn't know his purpose until he surrendered and had an encounter with the presence or with the love of God. And there's a lot of people to, in today's day and age who are trying to do things without the presence of God, without surrender. I'll just tag Jesus' name on it at the end. I'll get into this relationship and just tag Jesus' name on it. I'll start this and just tag Jesus' name on it. Why not just surrender and let Jesus tag his own name on it? Everything you need and you want in life is found on the other side of your surrender. I was going to call this message the other side, but then I was like, well, I'll just do don't push. Everything you need and you want in life is found on the other side of surrender. So let's all just stand up on our feet. Everything that you need and want in life is found on the other side of your surrender. And it's very easy, it's very easy to surrender. The first prayer I ever prayed, I grew up Catholic. Anybody else in the, in the house grew up Catholic? Yeah, praise God. I've got respect for the, the religion and everything, but I, I, I would pray the Hail Mary and the Our Father. And uh, one day I just put the, put the beads down. And I was like, man, God, this, this don't work. And I surrendered. I said, God, I want to know you. I said, God, I want, the so I want to know who the soccer players point to when they score. That was my first prayer. My first real words to God was, I just want to know you. If that's all you know how to say, I promise you. That might be the greatest prayer you've ever prayed. That's the greatest prayer to this day I've ever prayed. I've memorized scripture, but the greatest prayer I've ever prayed was, God, all I want is you. I just want to know you. And we don't have to go there, but in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 19, it talks about how God can make a way in the desert, how he can make a way when there's no way. He's worthy enough to give your life to him. And uh, I believe as a parent, I have better interests for my kids than what they have in themselves, if that makes sense. God has better interests, better plans for your life than you have for yourself. But you'll never touch God's plans outside of surrender. You'll never trust true satisfaction outside of surrender. You'll never touch it outside of his presence. So let's all just bow our heads. And if you're in the room today and you say, you know what, Brother Phil? I have never really given my life to Jesus. Yeah, I've kind of known about him, but I've never really given my life to Jesus. And I want to surrender today. Then can you just lift your hand up? And I know most of us are family in here, but if you're sitting out there today and you're saying, to be honest, Brother Phil, I serve here, I come to the church, I love the church, I love Jesus, but I really haven't surrendered lately. And I have surrendered, but I really haven't been consistent in my secret time with God. Then can you raise your hand up? you're saying, yeah, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I want to take a new step into really surrendering and being consistent today. If you say, I want to have spiritual muscles like Brother Mike instead of Brother Phil, then raise your hand up. Consistency. Or if you're out there and you say, you know what, Brother Phil, I haven't been coming 
to the church too long or I have been coming to church for a while and you're not a member yet. Just like at a gym, um, you have to sign up to become a member. Now we welcome everybody here, of course, but we want you to take some membership classes so that you can get the heart and the vision behind Restore World Church, behind Pastor Claude and Minister Rosie, and so that you can jump on board, jump on the team and start to contribute to the success inside the building and outside of the four walls. If you say, I want to be a member of Restore World Church, can you lift your hand up? Nice. We've got one hand for rededication and three hands for membership. So if those people who raise their hands, if you could come up to the front. Aha. And I think we've got one more coming over here. And then for membership and rededication, they will pray with you guys. I'm going to say a quick prayer and then I'm going to be done. But I do want to let you guys know who want to be members. Um, everything I said today about surrender, our pastors have the greatest heart of surrender, in my opinion. The greatest heart of surrender. I, a pastor was at, the, at our Ipsy location. I got out there pretty early and I was like, man, I'm out here early. This Ooh, this is tough, kind of. Pastor was out there 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m., shoveling snow as the pastor because he surrendered to Jesus. <laughs> Full of surrender. So I'm going to pray a quick prayer, and then if you four can kind of just peek your head over to Pastor Sturgis with the legacy on his mask, you guys can go that way as soon as I'm done praying. So if we can all bow our heads, let's pray. Father God, we decree and we declare that you are all that we want and you are all that we need. And today, Father God, we take a step, a big step, a leap in the direction of surrender. And we decree and we declare, Father God, that we're not just surrendering because of our emotions or our feelings in the moment, but we're surrendering and being consistent because we love you, Father God. We decree and we declare that we would rather be gatekeepers in your house than living the good life in the house of the wicked in Jesus' mighty name. Father God, it's only in you that we live, move, and have our being. So we surrender all to you today in Jesus' mighty name. If you surrender and if you love Jesus, give him one more big shout of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Well, if you guys can just go with Pastor Sturgis right here. Everybody else, my time's up. I love you guys. Don't be too harsh on your kids now. Amen. Hey, Restore World family. Thank you so much for joining us today on our online service. I pray that it blessed you as much as it blessed me. And if you were so deeply impacted that you gave your life to Christ, or you have any prayer request, or you simply want to give, I want to take this moment to encourage you to visit our website at www.RestoreWorldChurch.com. Once again, www.RestoreWorldChurch.com. And when you go on that website, you will have all the information that is necessary to you. It will be available right there at your hands so that you can get all of your questions answered right then and there. We love you. We pray that God blesses you and your family tremendously. And we'll see you next week.